Last but certainly not least, Ambassador Richard Verma of the United States. Ambassador, we've all had real positive feelings about what's been happening with the Obama administration uh, over the last few months, within the US, but also in its discussions with China and India. <coughs> so over to you, we're really looking forward to hear, hearing from you. The organizers have said we've now got till 10.30, so uh, you've got your time. Okay, great, thank you very much. And I, I know we're, we're over time, so I'll, I will be, uh, I'll be relatively brief. Let me just thank you for the invitation to be here, and it's great to be with all, all these distinguished uh, panelists. I just want to make uh, four maybe quick points. First, let me say that the President Obama's visit last week with Prime Minister Modi, climate change and clean energy was a significant component of the visit, of the summit, and of the talks. And there was significant say convergence of interests and shared stories about the impact of climate change that's having on both of our countries. The president noted that 2014 is now perhaps going down as the, the hottest year uh, on record <clears throat> and the United States has been severely impacted with severe weather, severe storms and India of course has been severely impacted as well. The water shortages, the glacial melting, the severity in the monsoons, the irregularity, in the water supplies, the severe droughts, particularly in the north. So it was, it was a significant uh, convergence, but not only just on the challenges, but I think they both agreed and echoed something that Secretary Kerry always says, which is the solution to climate change is energy policy. And so there was a significant discussion on energy policy and clean energy policy. So the, the first point I would just say, that this was really a foundational part of a, a very historic summit that took place next last week. Uh, secondly, I would say that while developing countries are emitting over 60% of global emissions, the United States recognizes its role in contributing to the problem, and so it has taken a leadership role in mitigating uh, greenhouse gases. The U.S. experience is proof that economic growth and emission reductions can go hand in hand. For example, the U.S. economy is 60% larger than it was in 1995, but carbon emissions have returned, have returned to 1995 level, levels, which means we can create jobs for our future by investing in a healthy economy today. We're targeting emissions from the largest sources of pollution, transportation and power plants, which enables us by 2025 to reduce emissions almost 28%, 28% from 2005 levels. And this ambitious target doubles the pace of U.S. carbon pollution reduction between 2005 and 2020, and the commitments are consistent with achieving the deep economy-wide reductions that we need to take by 2050, and the trajectory is consistent with the goal of keeping warming below two degrees Celsius. And not only at the federal level, but nearly a dozen U.S. states are also implementing their own market-based programs to cut carbon pollution. More than 25 states have energy efficiency targets, more than 35 have clean energy targets, and over a thousand mayors of U.S. cities have signed agreements to cut carbon pollution. Third, although the U.S. is doing a lot, the U.S. and India can do a lot as well, and we're excited about India's ambitious commitments to renewable energy, including its target of achieving 100 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2020, and the new and existing cooperation our governments have, have taken. And even before the President's visit last week, we were already cooperating with India on energy access and clean energy, and we added several new initiatives when Prime Minister Modi visited us last September as well as announcing our intention to open up new pathways for cooperation on areas like air quality and climate resilience. Our U.S.-India partnership for clean energy has already mobilized $2.4 billion. Uh, XM Bank is talking about an additional $1 billion in clean energy financing, and USAID is helping to build the capacity of India's power grade to integrate renewable energy. We've developed a climate fellowship. We came out with a strong statement in our joint statement about what we can do together in Paris, and we reaffirmed our commitment to make concrete progress to phase down HFCs under the Montreal Protocol. And we've moved closer to the day when U.S. companies can begin the construction of modern and clean nuclear power plants. If we do this right, we can conclude a lasting agreement that applies to all countries that includes ambitious mitigation targets 
and a strong accountability system to see those targets through, including monitoring, review, and sound rules that promote trust. The agreement should have a lasting structure that regularly brings countries back to the table to commit to stronger and stronger targets. A successful agreement will elevate the importance of adaptation and resilience with a focus on better planning and more support for implementation. It will promote significant support for those countries that need it most. It will create opportunities for countries to take new action to protect their forests and other lands. The agreement must be fair so that every country is spurred to do the must it can do, but none is forced into action. It sees as inconsistent. So the successful agreement for the world and for India are tremendous. Better health, energy security, resilience, climate security, food security, ecosystem health, and sustainable economic growth. India and the world will benefit as much, and India as much as any country will benefit from a strong and comprehensive agreement this year in Paris. We look forward to working with everyone over the coming year to ensure that we conclude an ambitious climate agreement in Paris in 2015. Thank you very much.